In the meantime, I was hoping to make our uh, morning announcements. Uh, so just while I have your attention, I'm Julie here, host for this room and club. Uh, as we get started, a few clubhouse pointers. Uh, you can use the little plus sign at the bottom, which we were just talking about, to ping people into this room that you think may be interested in the conversation. Uh, clubhouse will limit you to a certain number of pings, so use that search bar to narrow down uh, to words like clinical trials or research, and people with that word in their bio will pop up, making it easier, uh, especially if you have a lot of followers. Be sure to follow me and all our moderators here, our panelists, our co-hosts. Uh, you'll want to check out others in the room as well. So anyone with a little party hat next to their name, they're new to Clubhouse, might consider following them. Uh, get them into the Clubhouse rabbit hole. Uh, we certainly encourage everyone to raise their digital hand as well. We like this to be an interactive room, so um, we'll do our best to get to everybody if you would like to participate. Uh, additionally, to support those using closed caption, please state your name when you begin speaking and state your name again at the end. So my name is Julie and I'm done speaking, for example. Um, please note our club is called Consoli Conversations. Uh, in addition to this room, we host a Data Dignity and a Long COVID Patients Meet Researchers room. You can learn more by following our club, ping the little greenhouse at the top. Uh, you'll be able to see all of our upcoming rooms there. Um, and for any direct questions, comments, feedback, suggestions, if you'd like to join the panel or you have someone that you'd like to recommend, please send me a direct message. Uh, you can do it through the back channel here. My email is in my bio as well. Um, additionally, all of Consuli's socials are in my bio. Please follow us, learn more about us. Um, for those that you don't yet know Consuli, broadly, Consuli is a public benefit company with a mission to enable individuals to participate in the data economy. Uh, experts do suggest our individual data is worth 20K per year. So we help people choose who gets access to and how their personal information is used and if and when desired, get them paid for their data and make medicine better. We do this by operating a marketplace for members where we become their agent. Our members receive smart matched individualized offers from us for opportunities, including to participate in clinical trials and data trials. There's no cost to join our movement. You can learn more at consuli.net. That's C-O-N-S-U-L-I.net. Again, all that information you can find in my bio uh, and Consuli Conversations bio. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to our room co-facilitators, Michael Young and Talia Height. Uh, they'll be introducing themselves in our expert guests. Uh, Michael, over to you. This is Julie and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Julie. Um Hello, clinical trial clubhousers. So here we are. Um, this is a monthly event. Uh, happens on the first Thursday of uh, every month. And uh, we hope to take you on through the holidays here. Um, we will give you announcements as to many changes in dates uh, because of the holidays, but I believe we'll be in good shape here. And uh, I am just so excited that uh, we've got this group together today here. Uh, and I'm going to have each of them do a quick introduction in just a moment. But, uh, you know, the purpose of this is really to gain insights from experts who are um, in the, the clinical trial arena. That could be pharma industry execs, uh, patients interested in solving uh, some of these burning questions, as well as people who actually conduct trials. So um, we continue to, uh, to grow the the interest and the influence of this uh, clubhouse, so we hope that you will spread the word. And uh, joining to me now, joining to try, joining today um, is my very able co-host and co-moderator, Tom. So, uh, Tom, do you mind uh, bringing us uh, into the conversation? Yeah, Michael, it's great to be here. I, I feel sad that I missed, I think I ended up missing the last month and possibly the month before um, uh, clubhouse discussions. I'm really excited to be back this month. This is one of my favorite clubhouses. It's uh, super fun to get together and, and uh, talk about, you know, all things clinical trials and really get all the different wonderful perspectives, especially those from patients and people operating clinical trials at the ground level. So 
excited to be back again. Um, I'm Talia Haidt. My background is in all things clinical trial operations. Um, so I've worked primarily at study sites, uh, including phase one units, and uh, started as a research coordinator on this journey almost 20 years ago and moved into a variety of roles, um, including through to um, uh, overall site management. I love taking this opportunity each month to bring our trial enthusiasts to the room and talk about our one, bur one burning question. So thanks again to Kazuli, Julie, uh, Michael, and others for inviting me to co-moderate this discussion. So we'll be opening up the discussion for our one burning question here soon. And before we do that, let's say hello again to some of the folks uh, that we have on our stage with us this morning. Um, we'd love for each of our panelists to please do a quick 30 second introduction of yourself and then we will get started. So let's begin with Christine, please. Christine. Hey, so Christine here. I am founder CEO of People with Empathy and a patient myself. Uh, interested in the clinical trial process because it was difficult for me and so really just here to share my perspective wonderful thanks christine great to hear from you um let's move on to sophie please sophie would you introduce yourself hi talia thank you my name is sophie johannan i am a clinical evaluation scientist at a medical device company called boston scientific um, before this, I was an auditor, and before that, I was a manager at a site um, and a certified clinical research coordinator, and I have a background in medicine, so I think, Talia, we, we have more in common than I realized, um, and it's good to be among this panel of people. I'm really excited to be here. I think this one burning question is a big one for the next three, four years, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sophie. Great to have you here. Uh, Lily, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, this is Lily Stairs. I am a three-time autoimmune patient and founder and principal at Patient Authentic, which is my consulting business. I, I work at the intersection of marketing and patient engagement to build programs that empower and educate patients. Uh, my most relevant experience here yeah, for this discussion is in my work as the head of patient advocacy at Clara Health. I was one of the founding members of the team there, and Clara Health looks to the next patient's clinical trial. So very excited to be uh, among leaders today. And again, my name is Lily, and, and look forward to chatting. Thanks, Lily. Welcome. Taya, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Italia. My name is Taya Romero. I have been almost 18 years in the clinical research uh, world, working at the CRO level. Um, I've been in the industry so long that I remember when clintrials.gov was mandated. Um, and I used to help walk clients through creating HTML um, code to, to get their trials on. So uh, this is all very exciting to see these changes in clintrials.gov. Um, my name is Kay and I'm done speaking. Thank you. Awesome, looking forward to, to hearing more from you, Taya. Justin, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Justin Gundelak. Um, I've worked in biomedical research at an academic medical center for about 18 years. Um, but uh, the first 15 years of my career, I was actually in uh, basic bench research, so nothing to do with, with clinical trials. Uh, it wasn't until I moved up into kind of uh, administrative management that, you know, some of the things on my portfolio um, involve uh, management of some clinical and uh, data trials. So, uh, you know, I it's an interesting perspective in that I didn't come up through the ranks um, on the clinical side. I, I kind of got thrown into the management side uh, without having been so close to it. So I, you know, work very closely with clinical trials, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it's still somewhat new to me and, uh, you know, kind of coming with an outsider's perspective and actually had participated uh, you know, always as a healthy volunteer, um, but, you know, had been on the participant side of, of clinical research for, for quite a while um, before I actually started working in the space. That's great. Really interested to hear your perspective um, since you've, you've got multiple on this, Justin. That's great. Um, also, would love to get an introduction from Almenia, please. 
Uh, hi, um, my name is Amini Atarbi. I um, work at Oncocare, so that's an oncology clinical research network. I've been working in um, clinical research for over 20, uh, 20 years, we'll just say 20 years, um, and I am passionate about um, reducing health disparities and also about uh, diversity in clinical trials. Thank you. Great. Welcome, Amini. Happy to have you. Um, we're really excited about this discussion. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. Excited to kick things off here. Um, and thank you to everybody in the room for joining us. Excited to get started. So I'll go ahead and summarize our one burning question and we can get right to it. Today, we're going to be discussing uh, clinicaltrials.gov, as you may have gleaned from some of the panelists' intros. So in August of 2019, the National Library of Medicine, also known as the NLM, began a global modernization project for clinicaltrials.gov. This modernization is planned to take four more years to complete. What are the most important improvements to this critical patient, public, and clinical development resource that we need to be that needs to be made right now? Why does this matter, and who needs to participate? Um, so we're going to start with our panelists first. We're going to get some some input from each of our panelists here on on sort of their perspective on this modernization effort over the next few years, and um, then we will open it up to the room. So please raise your hand if you'd like to be called onto the stage when we get to that section, and Julie will certainly bring you up to share your thoughts and and things like that. So maybe we can start, um, Christine. Um, we would love to hear from you first, if you don't mind kicking us off here from a patient's perspective. <laughs> I was going to ask for you guys to come to me last. <laughs> oh, we always I start with you because your perspective is cute. important to start with. I know, but I, I kind of, in this case, kind of want to hear what everyone else has to say first, only because, you know, when I started this, I spoke on stage a while ago with um, a company at Startup Health um, a few years ago, and it was really about their company and how they were reaching out to patients because of the difficulties. And I came on stage to tell the difficulties. I had with finding my own uh, options. So I want to hear from you guys first before I, I weigh in there. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the to share. Yeah. yeah. Christine, it's Michael. And I, I'm sure even in a cleanup batter position, you'll have a lot of good things to, to add sure. here. But the yeah. I, maybe I can help set the stage, Talia, that essentially this question came to us um, from actually from our last uh, clubhouse. And one of the, um, you know, one of the unique things that we do with uh, the Clinical Trials Clubhouse is we do focus on one burning question, which uh, we actually canvas nationwide for, you know, what's on everybody's mind. And, uh, and we typically take the last five minutes or so of this clubhouse to kind of uh, uh, solicit the panel and uh, the audience to see if there are other uh, real one burning questions that are on their mind. So just keep that in the back of your head as we uh, get to the end of this hour. Um, one of the reasons why we selected this particular topic um, was because uh, we recognize that clintrials.gov is the go-to um, authoritative uh, compilation of the majority of, uh, not all, but the majority of all of the trials that are underway, certainly in the United States, and typically there are global trials in there um, as well. Uh, it does a very good job with regard to uh, phase one and phase two uh, and phase three trials. Um, however, you know, it doesn't do a very good job with regard to a number of important trials that may be taking place um, at what are called the investigator initiated study level. So these will be single site trials, which uh, uh, may be focused in a, you know, a particular disease state and looking for additional indications for existing medications, or may in fact be experimental um, looks at using uh, novel uh, compounds uh, for, for indications that are not yet uh, a part of the label. So, this is, this is an area where uh, not only investigators and clinical trialists go to, to see what the landscape looks like, but it is also certainly a, a very important uh, reference source for patients who are looking for trials. And unfortunately, the amount of data that's actually there are um, 
something that's, uh, you know, not necessarily well referenced. And a lot of times you can't find who's actually conducting the trial. There's a whole bunch of, uh, of issues related to this. And I think that's part of what we want to do is explore how we could better, um, you know, better uh, help the uh, clintrials.gov people uh, actually come up uh, with, uh, you know, with better solutions here. So with that as a background, uh, does that, uh, hopefully that is helpful to you. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, Justin, maybe you've got some thoughts about that. I, well, I, you know, I always have thoughts, Michael. Um, I, I will say, you know, kind of going off of what you were talking about. Um, so all of the trials that I support uh, currently, at least are, um, like you mentioned, in investigator initiated trials. Um, you know, I, I think every trial has its own unique, you know, properties that, that kind of dictate on how it interacts with ct.gov or, or how, how that site is, is useful for the trial. Um, you know, the, the biggest trial that I work on right now, the, the problem that we have, is, or, or I, I guess I would say why ct.gov is not that useful for us as far as helping patients find us is that um, our we have a very short window of recruitment between when a patient is diagnosed with the condition that we're studying um, and when they can actually start the trial. Typically, uh, you know, the patient is, is diagnosed, and so it's a, a breast cancer trial. You usually want to get on the on the magic therapy, you know, the standard of care therapy as, as soon as possible. And the concurrent therapy that we are studying, we, we can't have you on the trial unless you enroll prior to beginning your your anti-cancer therapy. Um, so the big thing for us is that there's really no window for the patient to be out there exploring um, clinical trials to come across clinicaltrials.gov uh, if, if they haven't, if they aren't aware of it themselves or if their uh, physician didn't, you know, tell them about it or anything like that. Um, so it's, you know, the, the biggest issue with that one is not so much anything about the site itself and, and how patients I mean, it has its own issues. I'm sure it could be much better, but it's really just the awareness. And, you know, is, is there some way that, that, you know, the NIH can help just bolster the, the awareness of that resource for patients? So, you know, for this specific example, you know, if, if you know that you have a potential breast cancer, uh, diagnosis looming, um, you can start thinking about, okay, one thing that I want to know are, you know, what are the trials going on out there that would be, you know, potentially relevant to me um, and just have that, that window of time available to search so that, you know, by the time that you get to clinicaltrials.gov, you see our trial, it's not too late for you to be a, a candidate for it. This is Justin, I'm done speaking. Hey, Justin, I have uh, maybe one angle, the one reason why this may not be happening. Um, you know, a lot of times patients, when they're first diagnosed, they get a lot thrown at them, a lot of options, differential diagnoses, paths, uh, you know, for treatment, whether it's medication, um, especially, you know, if it's a, a cancer patient, medication, radiation, chemotherapy, um, um surgery and so it sometimes can be overwhelming to have access or to be um, directed to a website like this clinicaltrials.gov that has so many options and so much to look through I, as a patient at that initial stage when you don't know what your options are you don't know um you know, the prognosis, how, how bad is it? You know, um, you know, what, what are the risks? What are the, what are the benefits? I think that that might play a part. And so I agree with you. I think that, you know, we should make um, ct.gov more accessible to patients at their initial stages of their, of their disease so they can get in on some of these investigator initiated trials um, as well as the cooperative group and sponsored trials. But it has to go hand in hand, I think, with their treatment. It's another, I think we've talked about this in this room before, another um, reason why clinical trial discussion or clinical trial availability should be offered at the same time as standard of care treatment. It should be part and parcel of, their, of the discussion between the patient and the physician. Because without that, we're just 
we're just throwing a lot of information at the patient um, and expecting the patient to decipher uh, between them. They really need a coach, really need a guide to go through this um, information and be able to um, make smart decisions because they, they can't take every option, right? So what are the best options? So I feel like that's one reason why um, we haven't seen this quite yet. And we have to really think it through how to integrate um, these options into their initial discussion, consultation with their physician, so that they're getting everything at the same level of understanding, with the same level of explanation, same level of care, uh, and not being thrown a bunch of um, websites and, and pamphlets and book brochures to decipher on their own. And I think that's one of the things I was going to bring up for, I'm looking at a clinical trial right now, and it reads, not, and not yet recruiting, but there's nowhere on the page where it says when it's going to start recruiting. And then there's contact information and locations for the physician and the clinical trial staff for the patient to contact. So if I were a patient, I would right away call this physician or these clinical trial uh, staff members because I can't tell when this trial is going to enroll. It might be tomorrow. It might be next month, next year. And I don't want to miss that, that window. So I think we need to provide more information at a patient level if we're going to modernize uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And then we need to integrate that into their, their care plan, right? So if you just look at the title, this pilot will be a prospective randomized controlled open label trial of, you know, that's right there. Just, I haven't even finished one sentence and already right there. I'm sure a hundred patients would agree with me. What the heck did you just say, Sophie? You know, so we need to make it easier for them to understand. We have so many modern websites and portals now where if you read a word that you don't understand, it can be a hyperlink to, you know, a paragraph that explains it. Instead of having to go back and, and look this up, there is the how to read a study record um, link within clinicaltrials.gov, but then you have to find the word or the paragraph or the section that you're looking for. Instead of that, if we're going through and what is LVAD? What does that even mean? You know, so if you can click on as you're looking through the, the study and the title and the context and locations and the details of the study, if you find a word or phrase or sentence that you, you don't understand, you should be able to click on that directly and then take you to a hyperlink that explains that particular thing. And patients are also um, short on time, just, just like healthcare professionals. So I think it's important to make it the most efficient possible, the most clear, and, and first and foremost, integrated within their care plan. I think that's super, super important. Lily. Yeah, thanks. Um, really great insight so far. And, uh, I, you know, I will add that on the side of actually getting physicians and clinicians to be talking about clinical trials with patients, I mean, this has just been such an ongoing issue that we've discussed in the industry for a long time. Uh, that obviously, there are a number of factors from time constraints to what's what's the value proposition for physicians. Um, you know, I, there's been talk of can we get a billing code? for talking about clinical trials. I think that could be a really monumental step in the, in the process of, around awareness. But I, I want to focus on the, the one burning question here. And as we think about what are some of the recommendations for clinicaltrials.gov, anyone who's heard me speak before knows that I'm really big on how do we connect the dots and how do we learn from some of these consumer-facing facing industries that really listen to the customer. They put the customer at the center. And when I think about those websites that I go on to, oftentimes they'll ask me if they have different stakeholders that they're catering to, and maybe I want to purchase products. They'll ask, you know, are you, are you here? Let's say I'm like a first-time home buyer. Are you a first-time home buyer? Are you a, are you a looking for a real estate agent? Are you, you know, there's, you could they could categorize you and we actually just did this on i'm on the board of the autoimmune association we just redid our website and when you come onto our site you can see that we have a, a big 
section that says find information just for you, no matter where you are in your journey, the autoimmune association association can help. And it says, I'm looking for a diagnosis. I'm seeking treatment. I was recently diagnosed. I am a healthcare professional. I'm caring for someone with a, a diagnosis. Can we create those different types of categories for people who are visiting clinicaltrials.gov and then customize the experience based on where they're at? So I'm, I'm a patient who has, I'm, I'm a patient or I'm a healthcare, even at a baseline, I'm a patient, I'm a caregiver, I'm a healthcare professional. And then you, you design the site to fit their needs. The other big component to this, I think, is creating more of a two-way platform, two-way communication. And so that would mean that we, we give patients the ability to log in, patients and caregivers, the ability to log in to clinicaltrials.gov and to be able to see the studies that they're interested in, to know if they get have a notification that says that they've already contacted the site or they're waiting for a response, um, you know, as opposed to sort of this nebulous search and then you get taken off onto all of these other sites. So those are a couple of the concrete ways that I think we could really see some meaningful improvements as uh, clinicaltrials.gov, they, they go through this major overhaul. Lily, those, this is Michael, and those are excellent, excellent comments. Um, I think spoken, obviously, from the position of somebody who's attempted to get the best value out of clintrials.gov. Um, I'd like to make sure that, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to get uh, uh, a couple other new people who come to the stage here um, onto this. I am wondering, Lisa, do you have some commentary that you'd like to provide? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I joined a little bit late. I had another um, work meeting run over, but happy to be a part of this conversation and share the stage with you all. I just caught the tail end of what Justin was saying and um, Sophie, what you were saying. And, you know, to add to that, I mean, we, um, you know, I think that your rare disease patient or your cancer patient or, you know, cancer patient who is maybe not, uh, standard care is not working for them, is probably more savvy and they're, Physicians who are working with them are more savvy in regards to what their only option, right? So um, I think for me, the broader uh, picture here would be in regards to the question for the room with clinicaltrials.gov and this modernization is one, making the platform more user friendly. One, both for uh, physicians who want to go there and see what options are available because they may not be running those trials and typically. And if they're rare disease, they're going to be, or even oncology, they're going to be in um, logistical areas where those cancer centers are, those larger cancer centers who can run those versus what I would like to see is more democratization of clinical trials and access in other areas versus having to go to a major urban center. So making that one uh, knowledgeable and getting that information out, like Sophie was saying, to physicians so they're aware. And then for patients as well who may um, benefit from different treatments and um uh, versus what is available for standard care, just like your run-of-the-mill, maybe diabetes patients, right, who want to try something new, they've been on this medication, they don't like how the side effects of that medication affect them, and they want to be a part, and they, um, you know, are, are the altruistic patient, right, the one who wants to help those with their, uh, the diseases that, they're, that they are suffering from. So I think that what Lily was saying, I do think there are codes, not billing codes for speaking to patients um, about trials, but I think there's codes for, you know, once they're admitted and you're doing assessments and things like that. But I know that there are facilities and um, Mayo is one of them. But this is, you know, there. this is in the news, so it's not anything that I'm sharing about Mayo in general, but they're using AI and it's a program called IBM Watson to basically screen all of their patients to see what trials they would qualify for once they hit the system. So to Sophie's point, um, you know, hitting them, you know, getting access to that patient population as soon as they hit your healthcare system and knowing what trials they qualify for will prompt individuals at that institution to to talk to them about it or trigger the trial team to make them aware to go out and reach out to those patients and those physicians and it really does start with the clinician it is a partnership i don't think that we should be reaching out to patients on our own without having that kind of relationship established because there is a clinical component to this. Um, and there, there are some trials where you can just directly reach out to patients and they can make those decisions for themselves, but it should be, again, sending them back to their primary care providers um, to talk about that. And, it, and I think that exposes 
you know, clinicians to what is out there for clinical research. So in regards to the modernization program, I'm all for it because um, I think this has probably been spoken to before I even came into the room. Health literacy is a challenge. I think we see that here on Clubhouse and other social media aspects, and it needs to be in more layman's terms. We need to make, um, you know, sponsors be accountable for reporting trial results um, in a timely manner and in a way that is understandable for patients. Um, so those are some of the comments that I wanted to bring to the room that I've been thinking about for quite some time and was happy that you were happy in this room. I'm Lisa and I'm complete. Oh, Lisa, this is Taya. I have something to tack on to what Lisa mentioned about health literacy. I would also add that we need to have technology literacy because the way that the clintrial.gov is set up is very confusing, both for doctors, for sponsors, for patients. Um, a, for a long time, we had to actually do like HTML code to get the studies listed. And that was very, very complicated. Um, but now the searching features, I've searched myself through there and it's very complicated to get your location, to get your um, indication, all those things just right to get the results you need. Um, it's, it's very tricky. And we need a system that is very, very user friendly, that can even, you know, click, drop, drag. Any of those things um, would be amazing. Uh, not only, you know, having layman's language, but layman's technologies that people can use. Um, I'm Tay and I'm done speaking. Thank you. That's yeah, I was just going to say that's such a great perspective um, shared by Lisa, Lily, and Taya. Thank, thanks so much for you guys' views on that. Elmini, I would love, it looks like you came off mute for a minute. I would love for you to share if you have some thoughts. Yeah, I do. I just really I just actually want to, to, to um, follow what she was saying. So I think that the technology piece is really important. But I also think one of the things that we need to think about, too, is how are we doing clinical research today in 2021? And we're always talking about decentralized clinical trials. And I think for, especially for urban, um, rural and underserved patient populations, having something that shows that those studies are either hybrid study or decentralized trials that they can do at home so they don't have to look and say, oh, it's only taking place, you know, um, and then over in the next state or so far away, that that would be helpful for patients as well. So, you know, kind of like we have a little house icon on Clubhouse, maybe we have a house icon there for, for those patients as well. Can I go next? Absolutely, Christine. Okay, so hi, this is Christine. And I'm going to say one thing again that I keep saying in all of these rooms, I think we need to offer clinical trials when you first sign up for an insurance, you know, program or plan or whatever you're enrolling in, because I think that's when we need to start educating Because at that point, you can say, you know, here are, you've been diagnosed with this. Here are the standard care treatments that are offered now. Here are the results of the patients that have had and been in these studies. But here's an option for you as well if you want to look into something different. And I think that we have to offer that as an option before somebody gets sick instead of offering it them in their moment of distress and making them sign a 75-page contract that you're not going to read through. But in regards to the clinicaltrials.gov, I just search clinical trials right now. There were five other options before clinicaltrials.gov came up. And then once I got there, my disease isn't even there. You know, I'm looking at another one that the study has offered in China, but it's giving me a warning that says this may not be FDA. I just lost my page. But, you know, it, it, as a patient, a normal patient going through this, this would be scary. So how do you make this not so scary? I'm sorry, my garbage truck is going on in the background, but I'm done for now. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Uh, we've uh, been jo joined by uh, Joe Kim. And Joe, um, if you'd like to weigh in on this uh, revitalization of uh, clintrials.gov, I'd love to hear your perspectives. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. I'm not sure what else has been said, so forgive me if this is redundant. But one thing that we've discovered at several, <laughs> at several different companies is that despite the, I don't know, the ugliness and the, 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 the uh, the wonkiness of clinical trials.gov, it's actually 
not that bad. What I, what I think is terrible is the language. And we like to point and point at CT.gov as the problem, but that language comes from sponsors. There's no rule in the registry that we have to populate those listings, that registry, with the with the most you know unfriendly language. We could absolutely use plain language and register each and every study in a way that everyone could understand. Um, so instead of you know pointing fingers at the platform, you know it's, it's the content as well, and we could we could do better at making that more user friendly. Um, having said that, I've been recently, I'm still in one of the COVID vaccine trials. And honestly, I tried to look for a vaccine trial back in the early days. And, I, and I'm not sure how I got connected to the one at UPenn, but I don't think it was through CT.gov. So um, there was still some issues around really trying to find the right trial there. I think I found it through either UPenn or maybe it was clinical trial media. They were, they were doing a registry of signups. Um, at any rate, uh, that, that's that's been like my biggest aha moment, I think, for the last few years. So, just Michael and I uh, agree with you more. Um, you know, obviously, the the data and the language that goes into clintrials.gov is often um, written by individuals who you know are thinking about um, really the scientific side and the clinical side of things, and not recognizing that um, the uh, description of the trial and the access to the trial, et cetera, um, they really need to be much more uh, general population focused. Um, I wanted to just take the opportunity to uh, bring up something that Christine Naro, who um, participates in this clubhouse, uh, clinical trials clubhouse frequently, but unfortunately um, is sitting out in the audience because she can't talk right now, but she uh, um, sent in a really important comment and that allies with, uh, with what you were talking about, Joe. One of the big problems with clintrials.gov is the people who are posting to this um, are often in... Um, you know, transitory roles. They they are especially through this pandemic. Uh, there's been a lot of changes that have happened uh, at clinics, at uh, um, at sponsors uh, like your company. Um, a lot of things have uh, have changed around, and so because of the inconsistency of who's actually providing this information, um, it it gets poorly represented. So thanks, Christine, for for that uh, uh, that volunteer note. So I wanted to check on really quick. This is Chris. Sure, please. I just wanted to say, uh, Jess, you're right. I Every clinical trial or study I have been on has not been through clinicaltrials.gov. It's been somebody reaching out to me or my doctors giving it to me. So um, it hasn't been anywhere where I've had to search. Yeah, very Agreed. good point. Definitely I, not. Friendly. Uh, I was just going to say, it's, it's just definitely not patient friendly. This is Sophie. I was thinking about what Joseph said in connection to what Lily was saying earlier, which is, you know, that it's definitely not patient friendly, but maybe we can have a difference in the level of access, like Lily was saying, you know, one level of access for physicians and providers, another level of access for patients, and another level of access for uh, sponsors, manufacturers, those kinds of things, so that for the people who have different um, objectives when uh, looking up a trial in a trial gov they can access what they want to access um, and find what they need to find for example you talked about the language joseph you know we make consent forms purposely at an eighth grade reading level so that they are legible and understandable for patients no matter what level of education they have so why can't we do the same um, for the for the description of the trial and clinicaltrials.gov if we have three different levels of um, access depending on the audience we could do that it would it would make a lot more sense this is Sophie I'm complete great input and great great perspectives thank you um, Julie I, I'm wondering if maybe we should um, reset the room we've had some more folks that have joined us that are that are in the room right now and we can sort of summarize again what we're talking about here Hi, this is Julie speaking. Thank you, Talia. Uh, yeah, I'd love to reset the room and uh, everyone, this is Julie. 
project manager at Consuli and host for this clinical trials room. Thanks so much for joining us for this really great and very much needed conversation. I want to take a moment to just reset, share a little bit about Consuli's mission. We are a public benefit company working to create a marketplace where we deal individuals like you and me into the data economy and help make medicine better by smart matching patients with clinical trials that are right for them. Uh, we're creating a movement and there's no cost to join. So check us out, sign up. You can find our website, links to our social uh, and my direct email in my bio if you'd like to contact me directly. I love hearing from you guys. Uh, be sure to follow our club, Consuli Conversations, tap the little greenhouse at the top. You can check out our future rooms there. Um, and please take a moment to ping others that may be interested in this conversation into the room. Just use a little plus sign at the bottom, narrow your search. Uh, with words like clinical trials that might be in people's bios. Um, and please, we encourage you to raise your digital hand, join the conversation if you find yourself inspired. We'll do our best to get to everyone. Thanks so much for joining. I'll pass the mic back to Talia. This is Julie and I'm done speaking. Awesome, thank you. Just to reiterate what Julie said, for those in the room, please raise your hand. We've had some folks that have come in. We'd love to hear from you. Um, while we wait to see if others in the room have um, any insights or perspectives to share, we can kind of go back to our panel here. Um, several people have shared thoughts, you know, ideas on how we can maybe improve this. Is there anyone on the panel that wants to come in and, and say a few additional things? Christine, I saw you come up. Yeah, I just wanted to add, this is Christine. I wanted to say, is there a way to use this proactively as well? You know, as I'm looking for diseases that are not here, is there a way that a certain number of people, you know, search for a disease condition? We can add notifications that if something comes up, that that's, you know, there. And if we're using that to also build a, a data pool, you now have established a bunch of people who now need this. So is there a way to really use clinical trials out that as well in a proactive sort of way to kind of seek out what patients are actually looking for in regards to diseases? And I'm Christine, that's my perspective. Absolutely. I love that perspective. Um, I'm, I'm, I am really curious about that. I mean, there should be with, with with all the algorithms and, and AI that we're using out there and the ability that, you know, for our web browsers and all social media to know exactly what we're up to at any given time, you would think that um, we could use the searches on clinicaltrials.gov, whether they're done by patients, providers, whoever those may be, to inform more what people are looking for. So I think, I mean, it's such an interesting topic and I, I wonder if anyone has a perspective on that. <laughs> And if not, we can hold on that because it's such an interesting thing. But I think yeah, when we hear from, that, yeah, um, go ahead. So back to the content piece, we did an analysis of CP.gov to look at how varied the language was in something like the inclusion exclusion criteria. And also forget about the titles, you know. And just to just to give you a benchmark, we we discovered that there were seven hundred different ways that people were trying to. Uh, explain this, the, the very simple criteria of, you know, someone cannot be pregnant. <laughs> that was like an exclusion criteria. And there were wow. 700 different ways to, to for all the variety of sponsors on there to list that. So it could be, you know, negative, you know, HCG tests, uh, people, women under over 18 and child, you know, you can imagine how many different ways you can just say, this person must not be pregnant or able to be pregnant. And now that's an easy one. Now imagine all of the other things, right? A1C less than or not greater than or equal to less than. And you start to pile on these things. And yes, AI could make sense of this probably. So, but someone still has to go do that, uh, make sense of all of those words. Um, and then it has to be, I don't want to say fact check, but AI just doesn't work where you just apply it to a, a huge language data set and it's going to work. Like there's got to be some curation in there. Um, and, and it's very hard to do. Uh, I think the idea is fantastic. Uh, but again, it goes back to the, the Babylonian language and content that we all populate this platform with. You know, CP.gov is just an empty shell. We are filling it with a variety of nonsense sometimes or things that aren't harmonized or well or able to be harmonized. And that makes it difficult. So I have to say, just I'm, I'm glad to hear actually that, that you're doing that sort of analysis because um, it 
you know, that's exactly the type of work that needs to be done to get back to, you know, what Christine was actually asking for just a minute ago. Um, and I'll say, as I was kind of doing just a little bit of, of back research about the ct.gov overhaul prior to this conversation today, you know, I came across a blog post from the NIH where they were kind of just giving a high level overview of their process for, you know, determining, um, you know, what needs to be done in this. And, you know, as they were talking about their stakeholder, uh, you know, engagement going in, they, they broke the the stakeholders down to three buckets. One is data providers, so essentially study teams, whoever's, you know, putting their studies up on here and, and keeping the data, you know, up to date. Number two, obviously, is patients and their advocates. Um, but I was really interested and happy to hear number three was is data researchers. And, and the way they describe it on that blog post is people who use clinical trial information to study the clinical trial uh, research enterprise, such as detecting trends in research and gaps in medical knowledge, identifying trials for use in uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So I, th that, that was something I was really um, happy to hear. And it sounds like it kind of is the, the, the realm of research that you work in, or, or at least partially, Joseph, in that, um, you know, like, like Christine said, that it would be a waste to have all these search results going into ct.gov and not somehow use that as a, a way to kind of pull the the, the landscape of research and really where I was thinking about it uh, on, as uh, again, you know, leading into this conversation was, um, you know, should we be using that at least in, in part to, to be guiding where, where the NIH is, you know, directing funding one way or another, if, if we have, you know, if we see people, patients, um, you know, searching for, for studies on particular um, disease conditions or, you know, and, you know, what are the search terms that are popular and especially ones that are not turning up results? You know, is that where we should be partially directing our funding? Because it's obviously where, where the gaps are. But again, not knowing what is already going on in that space, it sounds like there must be some sort of a use in that regard, um, because that is one of the three buckets of stakeholders that they looked at as they were going into this initiative. Very good. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Brianna, who does research in this arena, um, to, to add a couple comments here. Brianna, can we ask you? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for bringing me up on stage. I, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so I've been in clinical research for about a decade now. I've worked with different, you know, investigator-led trial sponsor. I've uh, worked with CROs. So I've kind of gotten some experience, you know, from different places and I've noticed also just working with you know clintrials.gov a big chunk of you know what I noticed was a lot of the information is obviously never updated or isn't updated uh, and so I think you know a big focus sorry if you can hear my newborn in the background but a big chunk uh, I think needs to be fo the focus on the study teams right like they're the ones that make up are the backbone for these studies and there were so many times in the med -onc clinic that I worked with that you know we were getting ready to look for a study and I would contact you know whoever was listed on on the site and they had either closed it up or they weren't accepting anyone but the information hadn't yet been updated so that was a huge barrier another one I noticed was you know it really depends on this type of support that that research department has for one department i remember they would have their their coordinators you know come in as a part of the consult they would all you know they had a whole packet ready and uh, would let the patient know hey this is what we have available to you other departments didn't other hospitals had their own little website for research so you know and at the end of the day like i said i think a big chunk of the focus should be on those study teams because if they have a really good coordinator who can focus on, you know, making sure that clin, uh, trials.gov is updated or, you know, is available for those initial consults or is that contact person, you know, you, you, it makes a huge difference. And so I think the study teams really, you know, should be a big focus. So uh, thank you very much. I'd love to just jump in, Brianna, and, and say that I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. I was actually recently chatting with, and oh, this is Lily, by the way. Apologies for not introducing myself. Uh, you know, I was just chatting with a prospective client, and we were talking a little bit about their, their current study they have going on. And 
I said, well, what's, what's going on? Do you think patients know about it? They're like, no, patients are really excited about it. The biggest issue we have is that patients call into the sites and the study coordinators don't get back to them because there's just, for, for whatever reason, right? There's, there's a whole laundry list of reasons that that could be going on. It's a huge problem. And it goes back to this idea of the need for tech, tech plus a human touch. The study coordinator is such a critical piece, that human touch component of this process. And we can't lose sight of that. And I think that, um, you know, you're, you're spot on. The more that we can help support the study coordinators, the better the overall experience is going to be for patients. And at the same time, I'll also add finding other ways that we can continue to marry that tech with the human touch. And so what, where are the, the spaces on clinicaltrials.gov? Can we get volunteer navigators to help patients who are struggling, who maybe aren't as tech savvy? Because even if you have some of the best tech minds that come together to work on clinicaltrials.gov, there are still going to be people who have trouble navigating it. And so how do we help those folks? How do we make it more accessible? Very good, Lily. I appreciate that. Uh, Talia, um, I note that you've just posted uh, a uh, great little link here. Do you want to talk a little I bit did. about that? Yeah, and we're trying a new feature, so bear with us um, in the in the clubhouse. We're, we um, just updated the link pinned to the top of this room um, with an article. Uh, this uh, actually a coworker of mine um, who works on the data side. Uh, previously worked at, with this the person that wrote this article and it's from a data perspective um some priorities that they are recommending for modernizing clinicaltrials.gov really from the, the standpoint of trying to facilitate um uh, transparency in observational research or real world evidence trials so just pinned that here for anybody that wants to take a look at it again it's really from sort of a different perspective about sort of data um all important of course but just an interesting article i think very good um clubhouse continues to to innovate on some of the things that they're doing so we're trying to take advantage yeah. of this <laughs> In I've been fact, wanting to try that, so thanks for showing me. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, I, I, I have no doubt that you'll find liberal uses for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me let me come back to um, uh, to Sophie. Um, are there uh, things that you're seeing out there uh, in terms of hurdles that need to be um, need to be raised about clintrials.gov? Yeah, like I said, it's, it doesn't seem to be geared towards patients specifically, you know, and so if we're trying to hit all of the, the key stakeholders, I think, you know, who is more key than the patient, right? So I, I really liked Lily's idea about separating out into um, three different portals or, or, or three different access levels of the same portal and providing that patient view. I think that would make it a, a lot easier. But broader than that, like we talked about earlier, to be a support for patients coming from the clinician side. And, and uh, who brought up the, uh, the, the issue with uh, coordinators not responding or physicians or uh, clinical research staff not responding when patients find that contact number in clinicaltrials.gov and, um, and call that number? You know, um, that was that was a good point. And I think there are lots of reasons for that. One, I'm not sure if the number and locations are updated at a regular uh, interval. Number two, I'm not sure that the uh, coordinators and PIs or sub eyes are aware that their numbers, their contact information is, is provided in clinicaltrials.gov and patients are using that to try to uh, find out about the trial and uh, find out if it would be um, relevant for their care. And um, three, I, they, they also may not have built into their schedule to be answering those kinds of calls and those kinds of questions. So we need to think about a resource for answering those calls, you know, whether it's building time into the specific research coordinator 
um, or um, physicians uh, schedule to answer those kinds of calls maybe once a week? Or are we going to have a call center or, you know, clinical trial professionals who are maybe uh, not assigned to this particular trial, but have enough knowledge to be able to impart the, the basics, uh, explain the basics to the patient and let the patient make an idea uh, assessment um, or a decision about whether maybe or not this, this trial might be relevant for him or her. You know, there has to be um, a contact, uh, almost like a hotline, because it's not working the way it is. So that's that's the pearl I would offer. Thanks, Michael. No, so, that's very good. Uh, Justin? Yeah, this is, this is Justin. I just wanted to comment on, on what Sophie was just speaking about. I, I think, yeah, ultimately we need to, you know, have study teams be responsive to patients that are reaching out to them. I don't know that that's something that's necessarily within the scope of what clinicaltrials.gov can do, um, but trying to think of ways that, you know, the that site itself can at least somewhat, you know, address that problem. You know, I was wondering if there should be some sort of feature where patients can, you know, give their feedback on the study or, you know, I mean, uh, I'm thinking if, if I'm a patient has a rare disease, I'm looking at ct.gov, there may be one or two trials for, for my condition and, and it's not that overwhelming, but I've got a really, really common condition, you know, any sort of cancer, you, you pull up just that condition without any, you know, more specific search terms, you're going to have thousands of, of results and that in, a, in and of itself can be overwhelming. Um, of the many ways that we can narrow it down, I, I mean, what if there was some sort of patient input for, hey, I tried calling this study team three times and they never got back to me. If I was a patient, if, you know, if I saw some sort of like People a, with uh, a Yelp rating, so to speak, I would know just to scroll past that one and, and go to the ones that, that patients are having good experiences with, not necessarily of the trial itself. I, and and that, that's, I guess, what, what opens up the bigger question if you're going to have some sort of a, a community um, input then, then what do you have that on? Because you probably don't want patients reporting on the specifics of their experience in the trial because then you're almost unblinding things. Um, but some sort of a, of a user experience rating, w would that be beneficial to, to the users? This is just you know, I think it all goes back to the content that's put on there. Like not every site's phone number is listed on every trial. And it's not ct.gov's fault. It's the sponsor's fault for not putting it there. Or there's like a 1-800 number that actually leads to some general customer service bank. Uh, and that's not helpful either. So, you know, I, until, and maybe you're right, maybe having reviews will, will, will change the game for a sponsor. But, you know, honestly, it's, it's having ct.gov add that seems to be, you know, swallowing a spider to catch a fly. Like, let's get the content right <laughs> and make it easy. Um, I'll also say that CT.gov isn't meant to be sort of customer friendly or patient friendly or people friendly. And while we can blame it for that, I also like to think about something like weather.com. Like all that data comes from publicly available sources that are not people friendly, but they curate it so that we understand the basics of bow weather. Uh, and we all go to it every day and it's free and it's free because there's advertisements on it and strange videos. Um, so it's, it's about who's going to be the weather.com on top of ct.gov that can make sense of all the publicly available data that's ugly and no one can make sense of, but then curate it really well for, uh, the everyday person. Um, I'm not yeah. sure what the business value or the economic, uh, model is for that. Um, sadly it might be advertisements, but uh, it's something, there is an analogy there in the real world. Yeah, Joe, this is Michael, and I, um, you know, for those uh, outside of this room, uh, you know, I, I've spent the better part of 20 years um, on the, the clinical development side of things, um, working inside uh, a couple of very large global um, CROs at the VP level. And I, I certainly, um, this conversation has come up in the past, uh, Justin, your comment about you know, essentially public relate, you know, ratings of particular trials or the user experience. Um, that's something that's been considered. But as Joe points out rightly, um, that was not the original intent and certainly uh, really isn't the intent of clintrials.gov as a clearinghouse. There are over 
almost 330,000 trials from 210 different countries um, listed on in clintrials.gov right now. And, um, you know, one thought that uh, that I had, though, would be analogous to the patient prescribing information. So you have the officially sanctioned um, PI that goes with any particular therapy, um, and then there's a patient version. I'm wondering if whether it's through clintrials.gov or as an independent uh, mirror to clintrials.gov, so I've got, um, a, you know, a for-profit scenario might be set up where uh, a patient's version of each of the trials that's listed um, could be created. I don't know, just something, uh, some food for thought there. This is Michael, I'm done speaking. I just wanted to add to Joseph, I think one thing we need to make clear that you mentioned is that, yes, it is the sponsor's responsibility to post information to there, so it's not you know, the site doing that. So if the site's information isn't there, that is a problem. And I recall having conversations with sponsors when I was working for a CRO, what information did they want to post there? And, you know, should we ask the sites what they want to have there? And, you know, there's so many options. You can just list the location um, and not put their contact information. And I think a lot of sponsors have opted for that. Um, and I know GDPR in Europe caused some confusion too. We were like, oh, can we post, you know, the information of the coordinators who work there? It got a little bit, you know, like, why not? And and so, you know, what you'll see more often than not, especially if, you're, if your trial has you know, Europe as a, as a country listed, then perhaps they just don't, you know, they just list the location, which doesn't help, right? You know where it is, but you don't know who to call. And then this, and I, you know, I told the sponsor, then you have to have some kind of central number for this trial that you set up so people know where to go. And I was just perusing because, you know, I, I just different large pharmaceutical companies, um, because for, if you just search like Pfizer, um, clinical trial results, or how can I get clinical trial results? Pfizer has a web page, but it directs you straight to clinicaltrials.gov, and, and the title of their web page is transparency. And I'm like, it's not very transparent when you get there what you're looking for. Um, Merck actually, it looks like, takes the data from clinicaltrials.gov and makes it a bit more um, readable with certain tabs, and um, you can you know select whatever disease, and it'll pull up the trials, and it'll tell you if it's recruiting or not, and. Um, and then it's a nice little push button for any of the items that you want to select, like locations. And um, I looked at one just now and it said for uh, it said the locations, but it didn't give where like the contact information for those sites. But there was a number uh, specific to that trial for that Merck trial. So, um, you know, there are tons of larger pharma who are doing that and calling it uh you know, patient portals or, you know, my study results or, or things like that. And so, uh, you know, I think even pharma has realized that clinicaltrials.gov has not, you know, done what it needs to do to help patients understand this better. So we need to do our part. Um, and, and that's part of, you know, a cost for them, right? So I don't know if we'll see smaller biotech or pharma doing that, but big pharma is actually doing that. And I think Pfizer definitely could revamp theirs and make theirs a little bit better. But uh, from what I can tell, Merck's looks pretty good. I'm Lisa. Oh, Lisa, hi. Well, Christine here. Wanted to know if I could add in a point. I wanted to know, as we we're talking about this, there's so much out there with the tech and the data in this room alone, Consoli, is around data. And how do we really, though, use this data in a way and connect these tech companies or tech platforms and these algorithms? You know, I, I have these conversations in so many different areas, right, down to just startups here in Silicon Valley. But you're also enacting CCPA, the California protection consumer privacy act right which will change things as well since it's similar to gdpr so i think we need to look at at the tech as well and how do you how do you use this how do you use the algorithm the ai to really help us push this forward and just kind of a question for you all not really a, a statement but christine i'm done no thanks christine i i think that you know obviously the infrastructure and the way in which this data is achieved uh, has to be discussed as well. Um, I'd like to ask um, Elizabeth Dreiser, who is also on this panel here um, and is the CEO for Consuli, who's been looking at a lot of these issues, um, to weigh in a little bit on, on your thoughts. Elizabeth, do you mind? Oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth is unavailable right now. Um, anyone else want to, to um, 
uh, chat a little bit about uh, what Christine just brought up. I also want to add to that, too. You know, we have the NIH doing the All of Us research, right? They're going to sequence a million people, and they're taking it on the road in a few months, right? So we have access to all of this other data that could potentially be pulled in to help us. But, um, you know, I don't see a real, real, I don't know, like, I don't know, collaboration here on the, the tech and the healthcare space. I see them kind of competing from where I, I am. So I'm done if anyone wants to add in. I think I, I will just add that. I think with the advent of COVID in this pandemic, I've seen more interoperability than I have ever seen before. I was shocked the other day. My husband was like, oh, you know, look at the kids. They're part of Epic. And we're now, we moved from Texas Children's in Houston to now positions at Cook's Children in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And he's like, look, we can connect our um, data from Texas Children's Epic to their Epic. Do you want to do that? And, and I was like, yeah, that'd be great. Because I, you know, I thought that they had requested the records already for my kids, but if they have that, that's great. And usually before you'd never see them. I remember when we were launching Epic and various um, facilities, I did the launch at Baylor College of Medicine and then did the launch at MD Anderson. And I was like, are we gonna, you know, we always trade patients. This is the world's largest medical center. Are we gonna allow, I'm like, no, we're not set up for that. We don't wanna share. And I'm like, why not? Because it's ridiculous to ask these patients. And especially at MD Anderson where they're coming from, you know, all over the world really. To, to try to have these stacks of records. I'm like, why are we not being more interoperable? And I think COVID has made things speed up in light speed compared to where we were years ago and made individuals and um, patients advocate for this type of, you know, collabor collaboration because it is, it's, it's just ridiculous to me. So I'm excited for that. I think it will take time. Not everybody uses Epic. Um, not all platforms were interoperable with one another. But, you know, owning your own, uh, you know, medical records, having that available to you and access to that, whether it's, you know, you've got a drop drive or a link or something that you can pull um, is helpful, but it needs to be, it could be better is what I'm saying. So I'm Lisa and I'm complete. Thanks, Lisa, for sharing that. Um, wanted to see if anybody else has any sort of final thoughts on this one burning question um, in the next couple of minutes. Otherwise, we're going to start to move toward polling the panel and the room overall uh, for what people think might be an interesting uh, question or discussion topic for next month. Uh, in December. So please be thinking about that and um, want to just ask if there's anybody else in the room or on the panel that'd like to weigh in on uh, this modernization effort and the priorities for clinicaltrials.gov right now. Yeah, I wonder if since all of the uh, clinical trials have to go through FDA approval and review um, in this country and EC review um, and approval or some of the European um, regulations, there's also Japanese and, and Australian and all those regulation bodies. I wonder if it would make more sense for clinicaltrials.gov to go through those agencies that have to have um, some of that, at least the, the bare minimum um, information for each trial updated so that it's coming from um, one source instead of coming from each of the sponsor, at least at the sponsor level. And each sponsor is very different the way they respond. And maybe that's why we get um, different levels of quality in, in the update of the information. I wonder if we went through some of these um, notified bodies and regulatory bodies, whether we would get a more um, consistent uh, pooling of information for these trials. I'm Sophie. I'm complete. Sophie, this is Michael. And I think that, um, you know, that's certainly an avenue to explore here. Um, you know, I think through the last hour here, uh, one of the things that just hit, uh, hit the mark from my standpoint, Joe, was your comment about the fact that 
we really need to make sure that um, those people who are listing the trials are thinking about the audience that's actually looking at that data and understanding that um, in advance the, the types of questions that they're going to ask and the, uh, the access that they need to individuals who can help answer them will only speed up and make more clear um, you know, what the, what the recruitment parameters are going to be, um, inclusion, exclusion, et cetera. The, it just, it, it's a morass that uh, many, many patients um, could uh, benefit from simplification and clarity. And I, I just love that, uh, that thought that, um, you know, the application process is not the easiest thing in the world to get your, um, to get your trial listed. But uh, if the thinking was, uh, you know, a little bit more, uh, understanding that there is a public relations piece to this, even though it might not have been the original intent of uh, ClinTrials.gov, it certainly would uh, would help uh, the patient populations who are looking for uh, possible problems. So thanks so much for that uh, thought. Anybody and else Michael, want to join in? Yeah, Christine, yeah. I just please. wanted to, to make one last comment. This is Christine, and I was I was thinking about it as we we're talking. And you know, I can find out about more sponsored trials through my Facebook algorithms than I can pick up on on clinicaltrials.gov. And so I think that's the thing that we need to look at too. It's the social media that is available to people out there. And are they going to studies that aren't approved by the FDA just because there's that ability now for organizations and, and people out there to, to market to a whole new audience that they'll do it in a way that is more understandable to a patient and, and then, you know, scam that, them from their data at the same time. That is so. both bad and funny. Because yeah, right. <laughs> going back to what Taya said earlier, we have to simplify not only the language and the organization structure of how the, the trials are listed, but also the tech, right? The accessibility. And part of the reason why you are able to um, access your options in Facebook easier than clinicaltrials.gov is because Facebook is technically easy. It's, it's user-friendly. It's very, it's very easy to find those algorithm, algorithms and look for what you want. Um, and similarly with a lot of the other platforms. And I hope that's, I hope that's where we go with clinicaltrials.gov. So Sophie and Christine, uh, you just took the NIH and put them in the metaverse. <laughs> Maybe they need to be that. <laughs> All right. Well, this I was just gonna, I'm glad Sophie brought up just you know, usability because I, I feel like that's probably the one big topic that we haven't discussed today. I'll, I'll say, you know, both prior to this conversation and throughout it, every time I feel like I'm like, oh, here's something that, that CT.gov needs to have that they don't, I go and look like, oh, no, it's there. So, you know, like Joseph said, it, it, it's a, and honestly, it's, it's a good tool. It's just not being used well and, you know, I know we've had a lot of conversation about, okay, the information that, that you know, the, the study teams are putting in there and the sponsors are putting in there, that, that's great. That's kind of out of the control, at least to a certain extent, of, of ct.gov. But what can they do? You know, as I look at this website, it just looks like something. It looks like a 15, 20-year-old website from a, from a user in, interface standpoint. And I think without even changing the content, just giving it a refresh, and hopefully this is in scope of what they're doing right now, but part of that depends on, as we've discussed, is, is the, the patient, you know, considered a, an end user of, of this site. Um, but, you know, I, I just wonder how much it would be a more user-friendly tool if they just updated, you know, kind of brought it up to modern web conventions. Yeah, it's, it's just, like Craigslist, right? It's, <laughs> 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 it, looks like, it looks like Craigslist. You are completely right. So. Yeah, it's just so bare bones. We can just modernize the tech itself. That would be a huge leap. And then we have so many other things to correct, but we would be so well on our way with just that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this, this, I mean, the insights, the thoughts um, that have been shared here for this month's One Burning Question have been really, really great. Um, I took a couple of notes here on some ideas, some things people have said that sort of 
could be interesting maybe for future topics. Um, Want to just pull the room right now. Uh, so for those that aren't on the panel, feel free to raise your hand here. If you have an idea around a topic you would love to hear for a future month, uh, either next month or in 2022 for discussion in this clubhouse, please raise your hand. Um, and we'll just open it up right now. Anyone on the panel or in the room, any suggestions on next month's one burning question? This is Christine. I'd like to see how we can combine or connect the tech with trials and see how we can give more options, especially as we have more and more data being collected on people as we get genomic results. And, you know, those are all, if you've been in the conversations with Alice Rathjen, right, those are location based and she sees a way of, of working with these like ESRI systems and combining that. So really, I think there's a huge opportunity right now with the data and the technology that's coming forward to really have these interplay and, and how can we do that? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Christine. Thoughts from anyone else? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. If any, if any, does that mean my topic wins? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw know, a couple we know of that other... you'll be advocating for it, but... <laughs> right? I'll keep pushing for that topic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I and and Joe, I, I did see you come off mute for a minute. I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. No, no, no. Just I was going to say goodbye. If people were going to say goodbye. <laughs> All right. We'll start to wrap up here then. Uh, Michael, do you want to help us wrap up? Sure. I just wanted to say that, again, this has been a really wonderful collection of contrib uh, contributors. And, you know, I know um, the feedback that we're getting both on Clubhouse as well as away from Clubhouse is that uh, this experience is really energizing. It's causing, uh, you know, the uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about things that are you know, most on our minds and most concerning to us. And um, I think that that's the purpose of the one burning question. So in closing, I just want to send my gratitude, our gratitude to uh, my co-hosts and uh, panelists. Thank you so much, Talia, for outstanding co-moderation and uh, certainly the audience for helping make this a fabulous discussion. Um, we're going to be convening again um, in the first uh, week of December. Um, and, uh, you know, while we're all waiting patiently for the supply chain to bring us um, everything that we need to our front door. So um, I'd like to turn this back to, to Julie and uh, thank everybody deeply for helping us uh, put this program together. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Julie here. Uh, project manager at Katsuli and host for Katsuli Conversations. Um, thanks so much to everyone for joining our room, um, our panelists. It was a really great discussion. Uh, <laughs> leaves us with so many more questions, um, which hopefully we'll pick up the next time. December 2nd is our next room. Same time, same place. Uh, hope you can join us again. Um, and then just as we wrap a few announcements, be sure to follow me, all our moderators, panelists, and co-hosts here today. Uh, you can, in my profile, you'll see all the uh, details of other rooms that we host, um, including our long COVID patients meet researchers room and our data dignity room, uh, all these thread together. So uh, check those out. You can also find that by following Consuli Conversations, just being the little greenhouse at the top. Uh, you'll see our rooms there as well. Uh, please follow us on social media. Uh, you can find that, again, in my bio and the Consoli Conversations bio. Uh, for any direct questions, comments, feedback, if you'd like to join our panel again, or if you have somebody that you'd like to recommend, please reach out to me directly. Love hearing from you guys. Um, you can find my email or back channel me. Uh, again, thanks for uh, joining our conversation. For those that joined after our opening announcements uh, and don't yet know Consoli, Broadly, Consuli is a public benefit company with the mission to enable individuals to participate in the data economy. Experts do suggest our individual data is worth 20,000 per year. So we do this by operating a marketplace for members where we become their agent and assemble their, their health data, including health records, labs, prescriptions, verbals, uh, quality of life surveys, et cetera. Importantly, members receive smart matched individualized offers from us for opportunities, including to participate in clinical trials and data trials. Uh, so if any audience members would like to 
Uh, can I up. push a Zoom event for tomorrow? Of course you can. <laughs> we have a, a Let me for, for health <laughs> for health reconsidered. We actually tomorrow morning have five white men on a panel that is uh, yeah it's yeah, actually you're killing entitled. me you're killing it's, me Christine. it's actually entitled michael you'll love this it's white men opting in and it's yep, i saw it about diversity equity and inclusion so it is literally a panel of five white men who are talking about how industry should change to include others so if you're interested healthreconsidered.com is where you go and i'll also be speaking on a panel with uh, about a project with PCORI tomorrow on on treatments available for lupus patients. So it'll be an interesting conversation there as well. So two Thanks for sharing, oh. Christine. Your energy is boundless. <laughs> hey, and I'm being pinged into a room. You'll love this one. Merck billion dollar COVID pill scam and fake labs. Oh, God. <laughs> the UK just approved their their oral approach. So yeah, I saw that. that. <laughs> Well, so, always a pleasure, guys. Thank you so All much, right. everybody, for being here. Uh, any anyone else? Uh, um, can I boom? please, Sophie? Right. We have one tomorrow. It's called "So You Have Cancer." Now what? It is the first is a kickoff of the room that's going to happen every month within Mending Medicine. If you'd like, I can I can pin the link here. Um, so it's it's somewhat related because we're going to have some clinical trials. Per, uh, professionals in that room, as well as um, a, a medical oncologist also to answer some questions, terminology, and the structure. How, what happens once you're diagnosed? I think this is a, just the beginning of a possibly a, a really great space. So I invite you all. No, we, we definitely want to support our colleagues here. Um, I think your room starts at uh, 10 o'clock uh, uh, Pacific time. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, we'll look forward to it. And it's uh, really for beginning, um, you know, for people who are getting introduced, unfortunately, to cancer. Um, but to uh, understand terminology, research options, and, uh, you know, really uh, how, to, how to network in that. So, Guy, will you send me a link on social media can I, so I can share it to some communities? I just pinned it up at the top of the room here. You got it. <laughs> perfect. Well, we're glad to be a connecting point as well as obviously um, a source of information. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, this is this is a great way for us to continue on a regular basis um, to, um, you know, support the, the clinical trial community and certainly the disease management uh, world that uh, patients are trying to wrestle with uh, as uh, there's just more and more information. So um, thank you so much to everybody for being here. And we'll go ahead and uh, Julie, if you'll close out the room, we'll be in good shape. Right. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining the room. Bye now. Hope to see you next time. Will do, bye-bye. Bye guys. Bye.